welcome to the show. It is um, February 11th, 2022. And let me start by saying that I am not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, let's get started. Okay. If we look at the front page of the Wall Street Journal on Friday, we can see that uh, the main article is that uh, talk of war, right? U.S. says Russia could invade Ukraine at any time. And this sent stocks lower. The Dow is down, the S&P 500 is down, NASDAQ's down, everything looks down. In fact, we see a sea of red everywhere. Everything is red, except for this one little sector. What's this? It seems to be green. How'd that happen? It's not allowed. <laughs> oh, wait, that's the, that's the energy sector. Oil and gas is up. <laughs> Exxon Mobil, up 2.5%. Chevron up to, up two percent, Conoco Phillips up one and three quarter percent. Hmm, wow, looks like oil and gas is doing pretty well right now. Hmm, interesting. So let's get back to meta materials. Meta materials, as we see, is up slightly for the week. It's up to a buck seventy eight. We had a, a price run up that went all the way up to two dollars or a little bit over two dollars, and then it, it got uh, mercilessly hammered down by the shorts. They might, uh, $2 might be one of their uh, their key figures. We don't know. I don't know. If we look at Meta Materials for the year, overall, it's uh, the price has been headed downwards almost steadily ever since you know, October, November time frame, at which point it was hammered by Carisdale Capital, which announced a short position. But it seems to have, uh, seems to be recovering ever since the, uh, the low that happened just around, uh, you know, just before the start of February. So... Seems to be coming back up here. Could be could be good signs. If we look at the short interest, we see the short interest is at all time highs. Uh, so uh, recently, the short interest for uh, the short interest is announced once every two weeks. So as you can see, it's um, uh, the last the last number that was reported is uh, from January thirty first, and it is at around forty million or so. So that's uh, that's a lot of share short. Days to cover is slightly down, but that's only because the average daily share volume is slightly up. So the short interest is really just, it's at an all-time high. Yeah. And that's why the stock is where the price is today. Okay, let's look at MMTLP. This is the Metamaterials Torchlight Preferred Shares. As we can see, it's been headed sideways, and uh, price is not really mo moving very much. It seems to be... Uh, yeah, it seems to be moving at, at minimal prices over here. It's barcoding a lot. We see that uh, if we zoom out, this is all the trading data that exists. We see that it uh, it zoomed up in price initially, and it's been relatively flat and stable. This thing has been incredibly stable. Let's not forget the MMTLP shares. This stands for the Metamaterials Torchlight Preferred Shares. These are the shares that will pay out... Um, based upon sale of oil and gas assets, okay, that that Torchlight had, right? So, um, so that's MMTLP. Now let's look at oil. And so this is West Texas Intermediate, in West Texas Intermediate, uh, also known as WTI. I see that it's up $92.28, last I checked. Uh, and for the year or so, it's been it's been headed upwards over the year, right? It started out some somewhere around I don't know, fi you know, in the fifties, high fifties, and now it's uh, ninety two. So uh, so it's been headed it's been uh, at, headed upwards. Let's not forget that um, what was it? Uh, Bank of America has a target of one hundred and twenty for the price of oil this year. J P Morgan somewhere around one hundred twenty five. Uh, for this year, and they're saying that next year it'll be somewhere around 150 or so. So if they're right, there's there's some big upside in in oil. So let's see what's been happening so far. That uh, that that was the stock price out of the way. Let's look at some progress. Right, we see that uh, George has been busy. He uh, he tweeted this last week, which I thought was fascinating. This is in the um, uh, this is in the Pleasanton. Um, facility that's in uh, it's just it's basically in Silicon Valley or close to Silicon Valley it's hard to say if Pleasanton is really well it's on the 
it's on the bay <laughs> so it's it's very close there if you look at his pictures this looks like the inside of a fab to me uh, this looks very fab like to me uh, yeah clean room like etc this is um yeah i mean you've got oh, you've got the waffle floors and all that so just fyi so so if you see the holes in the in the bottom of the floor that's because there's um, high pressure air and uh the the holes basically mean that there's um there's nothing under the floor and uh, dust and uh, dust and things like that. They'll go through the holes and they'll go down to the next next level down, and so the dust won't actually come back up. So this is a uh, this, this is a clean room environment, by the way. Just FYI. Uh, so it it looks really nice. It uh, he's come a long way. Uh, yeah. So um. So there's probably been progress in the oil co space as well. Uh, we just don't hear anything about it. So I'm guessing things are moving along. So um, I had some videos out when we talked about MMTLP. And really, there are two scenarios. Neither one has been, um, has, uh, neither one has been eliminated. So there's really two scenarios going forward. So I'm going to just reiterate and relist the two scenarios, right? The first scenario is that they sell all the assets, do a cash dividend, and then... Uh, and then that means that that uh, you know they have to pay the, the corporate taxes of twenty one percent, and then the MMTLP shareholders will wind up paying qualified dividends, right? That's that's the way this works out. So we did a calculation of that. Uh, the price. So um, so the way this calculation works, you got a price of oil, ninety dollars per barrel, cost of goods sold. I'm increasing that to twenty eight dollars now because of inflation. Recently, in the last week or so or two weeks, uh, the Fed announced. Uh, a large amount of inflation coming up. This used to be twenty-five dollars. I'm increasing it up to twenty-eight dollars now. Okay, that means you get a gross revenue of about six, sixty-two dollars. Ninety minus twenty-eight, sixty-two. It means the value now. We take that sixty-two dollars in terms of gross revenue, right? And the value of oil on the ground is priced around twelve percent. That means the dollars per barrel while it's in the ground is about seven dollars forty-four cents. The the um, now we. There's um, this, the revenue, so there's a revenue interest of 49%, and that is split, um, so the Torchlight gets 49% of all the revenue of that, right? The other place, like University Lands and, 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 and various other places, get, uh, you know, the extra 49, the extra, the extra 51%, and that gets split out. So the dollars per barrel, as far as Meta Materials and Torchlight concerned, is $3.65. Uh, now we take that and we multiply it across the 3.2 billion barrels of oil in the ground. That comes out to 11.66 billion dollars. Uh, pay the 21% corporate tax. Pay the 10% underwriter fee. And you're left with about 8.05 billion dollars. Split that across 165 million shares, and you wind up with a dividend per share of. $48.81. That's $48.81 based upon $90 per oil. Okay. So I took that same calculation and replicated it out for the various prices of oil between $30 to $120, between $30 to $120, $120. And I made a graph. Right? So this is scenario one. This is what scenario one looks like. So based upon the price of oil being either between thirty dollars to hundred twenty dollars you'll get a dividend per share of of anywhere from I don't know from thirty dollars you're at around a buck fifty seven but at 120 dollars you're at 72 72 dollars per share dividend right and we're currently yeah, we're currently in the in the 90 plus dollar range right so uh, we're we're around 92 we're around 92 dollars. So I'm saying that's in this range between $85 to $95, right? So we can expect anywhere from the $45 to $52 per share. Not bad. Not bad. So that's scenario one. So scenario two involves what's called a sponsored spinoff. The key, the key interesting thing about that is it results in a non-taxable event, right? We know that um, there's a large number of shareholders of Torchlight, namely McCabe and Berta and all, all those guys, and they would love to have a non-taxable event. So in order to get this sponsored spinoff non-taxable event scenario, you wind up selling off about 49% of Oilco, 
and the MMTLP shareholders will get the cash dividend, and they'll also get the remaining Oilco shares. So how does that work? So this, uh, so you'll wind up at the end with Metamaterials, which is MMAT, which won't have any oil co at all, which won't have any of the oil and gas assets. That will will be spun out into a separate company called Oil Co. Say, uh, of which, let's say, another company comes along. We'll call them Nextbridge, and they buy forty. They buy forty nine percent of Oil Co. Right, and they and you know they buy it for cash. So that cash winds up going to the uh, MMTLP shareholders. They'll get 49% from the sale of Oilco, and then they'll have the remaining 51% of Oilco, right? So that's uh, that's a sponsored spinoff, and that's a non-taxable event. So uh, so that's the second scenario, and the second scenario has a similar calculation to the first scenario, right? We go all the way down to to, but the interesting thing about the the uh, the calculation is that. Um, we don't have to pay the corporate tax, right? That's that's now drops down to zero percent. So you do the same calculation all the way down till you get to the dividend per share, and um, that works out to sixty-three dollars sixty-six cents. But that's for the value of all of Oil Co. Right? We no longer have all of Oil Co. We now have forty-nine percent of Oil Co. And we got the forty-nine. I mean, I'm I'm sorry. We now have cash from forty-nine percent of Oil Co. And that cash from the 49% of Oil Co. came from the sale of 49% to Nextbridge. They, they provided the cash. Cash went to MMT LP shareholders. That's the cash dividend that we'd expect from that. That would be about $31.19. Okay. That means the Oil Co. shares or whatever, oil, you know, whatever equivalent shares that will be will be worth about $32.47. Okay. That will give a total of about $63 total value. Okay, so I took that same spreadsheet calculation, went from thirty dollars to one hundred twenty bucks a barrel, and we made a graph out of that. Right? And in this case, it's a it's a two level graph. Um, the the um, the bright yellow is the cash dividend, and that's listed on top. And the bottom is the oil co share value. Right, so you'll wind up getting shares of oil co that's worth. Say for ninety dollars, you'll get thirty-two dollars and forty-seven cents worth of oil co shares, and thirty-one dollars and nineteen cents worth of cash. Right. So we're currently in the uh, at um, at ninety-two dollars per barrel of West Texas intermediary, which which means we're in this the in the red zone, right, between the eighty-five to ninety-five dollars barrel per barrel. So this is the amount of cash dividend that we could see combined with the combined with oil co shares we could see, and that would be non-taxed. That's a non-taxable event, right? So that that would be quite interesting. Uh, all of this information or all of this uh, calculations come from some original methodologies that was developed by Roller Pigeons. This is her YouTube channel. Check out her YouTube channel. Uh, I back tested this uh, the the calculation against the ConocoPhillips deal, which was a nine point five billion dollar deal, and uh, the numbers came out near exact, near exact. So I'm really impressed with this calculation method that she came up with, and um, and I used it. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Roller Pigeons, for the calculation method. Check out her channel; she's got great videos in there. Um, so there you go. With that, uh, we have some additional news. Uh, um, so, uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about about Fintel and 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 what the shares are. But uh, uh, long story short, on this is Fintel's numbers seem to be off. Uh, but sometimes they make multiple mistakes, and they come close <laughs> as a result of making multiple mistakes. <laughs> anyway, here's what I saw. So this all this part of the story started with a tweet that I saw from uh, Metamaterial News. It said, "Hey." State Street Corp. State Street Corp. has acquired 17.5 million shares of M MMAT, according to a, a, an SEC Form 13G that was filed. Okay, so we go to the SEC website, and sure enough, we see, hey, SC 13G has been filed. We click on that, and we see that State Street Corp., which is in yellow, <laughs> I've, I've highlighted that in yellow, right? They've they bought. 17,584,762 shares, okay? So they've got that shares, and that amounts to 6.25% of all of the, um, of all of the metamaterial shares. 
quite interesting there. Quite interesting. So we'd expect that. Um, Oh yeah, there we go. So we'd expect that that would that that would cause the institutional share values to go up in Fintel IO. So that's what I so that's what I did. I checked on that. Anyway, so let's see who is State Street. So quick question. State Street. Uh, if you click on them, on the, you know they have a website, www.statestreet.com. Uh, they this is what they have to say about themselves. They say that they are at the, they are at the heart of financial services. Their clients are at the heart of, of everything they do. They develop solutions to meet their challenges. They recruit the best, build partnerships, and innovation. Right. So they're they're basically a huge financial services firm. They're gigantic. Uh, they're publicly traded on the on the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, as of January nineteenth, they recently announced their you know their uh, fourth quarter fiscal year twenty twenty one results. This is their stock price. As we can see, it's been headed upwards since 2020. Um, but uh, if we look, um, they've beat earnings expectations for the last four quarters or so. Um, their price is up. They're worth uh, $36.5 billion almost. They're huge. $36.5 billion financial institution right there. Okay. And uh, if you go to their website, you see that they're looking at, uh, they're starting to look at some digital assets, meaning cryptocurrencies and things like that, and seeing what that, the 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 custodial ser custodial services might look like and what digital financing looks like. They're they're old money, but they're very interested in what's going on with um, you know with the newest technologies. Okay. So we also see another tweet that's quite interesting. We see State Street. Um, that their uh, their former CEO Joseph Hooley, okay, he's on the board of directors and chairman at Exxon Mobil, which is an oil company. So that seems interesting. And we have some uh, words from Bloomberg, t which talks about that. Hooley's previous ex ex uh, about um, uh, what is it? Exxon Mobil said today, Joseph L. Hooley has been elected to its board of directors, effective January 1, 2020. Uh, he serves a non-executive board chairman, etc., etc. His previous experience includes leading a large global financial services organization, which is State Street, along with operational and risk management expertise, etc. Okay? So, Hooli is, uh, on, according to ExxonMobil, he's been elected to the board of directors as well, too. And if we look at, um, at State Street, we see that... Uh, He's, uh, he's on the board of advisors there as well, right? So, could there be some connection between Metamaterials and State Street and Joseph Hooley? I don't know. Hard to say. Hard to say, really. Because State Street is so big, they probably have some association with uh, ExxonMobil already, right? So, I did a search on the SEC to see if they owned any ExxonMobil stock, and sure enough, they did. <laughs> they filed a 13G because apparently State Street owns. Ah, let me go back. State Street owns 5.98 percent of ExxonMobil. Okay, so they've got a ton of ExxonMobil stock already. So it's not too surprising to me that um, that their former CEO is on the board of directors of ExxonMobil. Okay, these guys all know each other. They all. Uh, they all go to the same country clubs, and they all meet at the same parties. That's just the way life is, okay? Anyway, so I looked at uh, Fintel to see if they had updated their um, their numbers with the 6.25% 6, 6 uh, of shares that uh, State Street has bought. And if we look, we see the institutional shares are about the same. About the same. Did we even add 6.25%? What's going on here? So uh, this is a previous institutional um, ownership I had um, taken a screen capture of a while back. We see that their institutional ownership has increased to two, from 226 versus 208. We see the number of shares has increased from 45.4 million from 41 million. So uh, more shares are being held. Uh, I don't know if the 6.25 shares are are like are. Are showing up here though, okay? 
But we do see that in the 13D filings and 13G filings that Fintel has listed, they've got the 17.5 million shares there. Right? It's the first thing that's there. Filing date 210. So there's a check mark right then and there. It's listed. But you look at this and you see that this looks strange because I see a number of Greg McCabe that says his percentage change is minus 20.89%. And it's like, what the hell's that? It's clearly wrong. And it's cl clearly, clearly wrong because if you look, he previously held 17 million shares. Now his current shares are 19 million. So his change percentage increase is positive. It's about 11%. I didn't calculate it, but it sounds about right. Percentage ownership is about, is you know, sounds about right. So clearly you can't be going negative in terms of percentage change if the other numbers are all positive. That's just wrong. <laughs> That's just obviously wrong. So something's going on with Fintel. I don't know what's going on. Uh, so institutional ownership is up. Uh, I didn't really feel like checking 226 owners to see what the the actual actual numbers are. But I figured, okay, might as well check the insiders because we saw the, the Greg McCabe minus 20% is odd. So we'll, let's see what's going on with the insider numbers, right? So, uh, so we see insider shares. We got uh, 41 million shares and 22 insiders, but that strikes me as odd because I seem to recall previously that they had about 50 million. So did a bunch of people sell their shares? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, the numbers seem to be going all over the place here. Okay. So this is, a pr this is what they previously had. So yes, they previously had 50 million and they previously had 30 insiders. Okay. So who sold? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here I put the original numbers into a list because I like lists. <laughs> uh, you got the names and the original shares as Fintel reports. Okay, this is what Fintel has reported. This is what Fintel now reports. Okay, so 50 million shares before, 41 million shares now. Okay, totals on the bottom. So I just did a difference, right? Subtract the... Uh, you know, subtract the the, uh, the now from the original. <laughs> and that clearly shows what's different, okay? So, these are the biggest items that are different, right? We got John Berta, Nadine Geddes, and, Th and Thomas Lipinski, okay? So, these are the, are, are the big deal. This makes up the biggest changes. Uh, there's, there are other differences, and these guys are really too small for me to even care about, to be honest. They're They're really small. So, uh, question: Did John Berta sell? <laughs> this is uh, this is from the SEC, according to what John Berta has filed. Guess what? He didn't sell. <laughs> Last filing date is twenty twenty eight oh seven, and if we look at what his last filing was, oh, geez, he seems to have a bunch of Torchlight Energy shares. <laughs> they were added. They weren't sold or anything. They were added, and he lists himself as president and CEO. You know, 1,875,000 shares. Okay, nice. <laughs> he didn't sell. Okay, so there should be no change to the John Berta status. We leave him alone at 1,875,000 shares. Okay. <laughs> what about Thomas Lipinski? Jeez, that also is in 2014. What an interesting date. So could this be similar? Looks similar to me. Let's see what the finding was. Oh, geez, it's 3 million. Nothing has changed. It's just an addition. <laughs> it's an acquired, right? We look at the the acquired shares, and now he has 3 million shares. And this was way back in the, in the Torchlight days. Uh, he didn't sell. <laughs> what, what, you know, what's the deal with Nadine Geddes? Okay. Well, her stuff is listed as uh, 2021, 11, 19. Okay, so at least that's last year. So here's her filing. Here's what she filed. Interestingly enough, we zoom in on her filing. We see that George Palacaris is also listed on her filing. Oh, wait, this is double counting. She and George both have the same shares. <laughs> this is wrong. I mean, yeah, this is good that, that it was filed with the SEC, but clearly Fintel is wrong in, 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 in reporting the stuff the way that, that they did. <laughs> so, this is a recap. John Berta didn't sell. Nadine Geddes was double counted with George Palacaris. And Thomas Lipinski, he didn't sell either. Okay, so this is the new. Th this is the numbers that I'm correcting from Fintel. 
<laughs> but interestingly enough, it comes out to between 46, to 46 million and 46 million 800,000 shares, okay? Let's just call it 46 million shares, okay? And you got maybe an upside of 770,000 shares. That means you got 281 million shares. Insiders are accounting for about 46 million shares. Institutions are accounting for 45 million shares. That means the shares available outside of that are about 180, 189 million shares. So that's roughly where we were before. Okay, so long story short, Fintel has a lot of errors, but the numbers in the end work out to be about the same. <laughs> Multiple wrongs make an almost right. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, multiple wrongs make it almost right. Anyway, I wouldn't trust Intel that much. Maybe, who knows, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll make some corrections. I hope they will, okay? I hope they will update their, their website. Anyway, so with that, I'm going to uh, end the video with some stuff you may not have seen. This is uh, the Wayback Machine. Uh, the way the Wayback Machine has archived the internet, and if you look back, this is from the old Torchlight website, and we've got some interesting videos about that you may or may not have seen. This is uh, drone footage that was captured. Um, this was a, a flyover uh, and a circling of the well of in the Oro Grande Basin uh, from Torchlight Energy. This could be the B-19 well number one, I'm not sure. Um, looks pretty nice. You can see that they have, uh, you know, they look pretty organized. They got their, uh, they got their rig there, and uh, and that's what uh, that's what the drone footage looks like. Uh, it's uh, it looks, uh, yeah, it's probably a DJI drone. I'm guessing. So it's a nice thing about modern technology. They can, uh, uh, you can see, you know real life as it is. Anyway, so that's what a well looks like. That's what a rig looks like um, when it's, uh, you know, when it's being set up and operating and running. You see some, uh, yeah, you see some stuff is, uh, is happening there. Adjusting the camera angle here on this drone footage. Uh, there might even be some, I don't know if, uh, something's going on down there. Look like, look like some sort of fire or something. Hard to say. Yeah, no, maybe some welding or flame. I don't know. Anyway, so that's uh, that's the rig, that's the uh, that's the drilling that's taking place, and um, we're gonna go to uh, a next video. This is um, all right, Scott. So I've been able to get a pretty decent sized sample. Okay, um, I wonder if you can really see that greenish tint in there now. So this is a sample from the A25 number one well. It's got an a uh, it's it's got a 41 degree API gravity oil sample. Uh, unfortunately, the video is on its side, as you can tell. But um, yeah, that's 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 a sample of what the oil looks like when it comes out of the ground. Um, and uh, you know, a uh, 41 degree API is pretty good actually. That's uh, that's in the uh, light category of oil. So and that's that's the uh, that's actually uh, that actually commands the highest uh, highest asking prices between forty and forty five, so getting forty one is pretty good. Here's what uh, here's what a flare stack looks like. So uh, so yeah, that, so this is uh, this is from the six thirteen uh, time frame, and that's that's the kind of work that that, that that they were doing. So here's here's another flare stack. This is at the Cactus A thirty five site. There's no uh, there's no sound on this, so uh, but you can see it's uh, it's 
pretty good. It's pretty decent. Uh, you know, they're actually burning off the excess samples. Oh, and here's a sample from the cactus A35 number one H. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Some videos of uh, what uh, oil work uh, was happening in the Oro Grande Basin by torchlight. In case you never saw those. So with that, let me uh, let me close up and uh, remind you that I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This information is intended for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, goodbye.